You know, we've been saying for some time that Bethany is a Jesus-built church. And that's because the Lord himself said, I will build my church. And we've lay, given three layers of the foundation for that. Of course, Jesus is the foundation. But upon that, it's a Jesus-built church when you believe in the great confession. Uh, Peter said that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And uh, that confession is foundational to building the church of Jesus Christ. Not only is there the great confession, there's the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We're built on that foundation, a foundation where we worship the Lord with a loving heart and we reach out to those in our community through mission and outreach. Then there's a third level, which is the great commission, the great confession, great commandment, great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a Jesus-built church. And as I look into the, the book of 1 Corinthians, where we're going to look this morning and next week, in our theme of being in our centennial year, and it's Labor Day tomorrow, thinking of laboring and building, the whole focus of the message here today is we are God's building. Now, I got a picture of the church building up there, the edifice, but that is not the church. That is where the church meets because the church is actually you. In fact, the text says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you are God's building. When I'm talking about being a Jesus-built church, I'm talking about Jesus building into your life. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I notice that God has given us a blueprint for the church. He says, you are God's building in verse 9, but in 10 it says, by the grace of God given me. God's grace, God's grace, that gift, the, whole, the church is a gift. I often run into people who say, you know, I don't need to go to church. I can worship God just out camping in God's cathedral of nature. Well, it is true, you can. But then why did Jesus say, I will build my church? Why does he say, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together with other believers? Why does he say that? The church is crucial, it's important, and it's the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. This is what God is doing. In the age in which we live, we call this an age of grace, it is also the age of the church because God has graciously provided us the church which he calls the body of Christ, of which Christ is the head. So we as a people gather together. We have a vital connection to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need the church. The, the blueprint of what a church should be is it should be a community where people have experienced the grace of God. From time to time, I tell you, there's that acronym that make, I, I always remember for grace. Each letter of grace stands for a word, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. To have the church, it cost God, son, his life. Because he died on the cross to forgive us of our sins that he might save us and place us into the body of Christ, which is the church, which is the church. It's the grace of God. That's the blueprint. Now, there's certain builders we're told, by the grace of God given to me, I, the Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter. He says, I have laid an, a foundation as an expert builder. He's the expert builder. And, and I notice that it says, he is, as the expert builder, the main contractor. He says, I have laid the foundation. So there's a, what Jesus Christ has done, and Paul comes on the scene after Jesus Christ, and he is laying the foundation, preaching Jesus everywhere he goes. And people, when they accept that message uh, of Christ, they begin to build their lives, the church, on that level, that layer of the foundation. As we go on a little bit further, he says, and someone else is building on it. Well, after the Apostle Paul, then there were the followers, the early Christians, uh, the the patriarchal fathers of the church, uh, they were preaching the gospel. It goes down through the Reformation period. They're preaching the gospel. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, and all the rest of them. And it comes to the modern missionary era where you got uh, missionaries going out of England and penetrating Africa and other regions of the world, America, and, and the, the gospel is being, being preached because one is building on top of another 
its foundation. So we got these subcontractors, so to speak, that are building the church of Jesus Christ. And then there's the laborers. But each one of you, now he gets personal. He points his finger at his audience as each one of you. Each one should be careful how he builds. You see what Jesus is talking about? I will build my church. He's doing it through us. We're living stones, Peter calls us. And we're all part of this building process. And he's saying, you've got to be careful how you build the church of Jesus Christ. He says, for no other foundation can anyone lay other than that one is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. You take Jesus Christ out of the foundation and the whole structure of the church, the whole edifice falls. Anytime Jesus is not preached at the church, that church is a weakened church because it is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So if you have a people who don't know Jesus as Savior, they have no foundation for the building upon which they are building. And so the church doesn't stand for the Word of God. It doesn't read the Word of God, teach the Word of God, because it has no foundation. Our foundation is on Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the point I'm trying to make. We are God's building. Built on those before us. There was Jesus Christ who laid the foundation himself. I will build my church. Then there's the Apostle Paul. He comes along, and he reads the, he's one writing this letter that we're reading, 1 Corinthians. He says, and you are God's building. And then there comes along in the 20th century, a gal by the name of Mary Barnett. Mary Barnett is really the founder of our church. She is. She started a Sunday school class way back in 1906, which later in 1917 became Bethany Church incorporated as church, right here in Pontiac, not too far from here. Now, one of our members of the church decided to dig in and find out a little bit more about Mary Barnett. And so I'm going to ask Karen if she would come up. I got some questions for her because she's been doing some research and study on the founder of our church, Miss Mary Barnett. Did she have a middle name, anyway? Yes, Anna. Her middle name is Anna. Oh, there you go. Hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Her middle name is Anna. Anna. Do you know when she was born? She was born in 19, oh, excuse me, 1876 or 77. There's a discrepancy. Where's this discrepancy at? She went to, she was enrolled in Kalamazoo College, and they had her listed as 19, 1877, but her death certificate said 1876. Oh. So in what year did she die? She died in 1951. 1951. You know, that is really an extremely important year. <laughs> you guessed it. You know the expression, when one person leaves the world, another one takes her place? <laughs> 1951. All right, 1951. All right, I, I, I got okay. another question. Where was she born at? She was born in Pontiac. Oh, so she was a native Pontiac resident. Okay. And uh, so I know she went to college. Yes, she did. And tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Okay, she went to um, the Baptist Missionary Training School. She actually taught there, but she was enrolled in Kalamazoo College in, let me see, I can't read my own, my own writing, I'm sorry, I'm blind. She was enrolled in uh, 1907 at the age of 31. At the age of 31, okay. And so isn't that about the time that she started the Sunday School here? That's right, she started, a, a, marching on the streets here in 1906. Okay. So she had had pre preliminary work at Kalamazoo College. They don't have the dates anymore, but she had done preliminary work there. And then she came here and started our church and then wrote the letter and then went on to college. So did she have any other career? I mean, she just came here, showed up? I mean, how, how did that work? No, she was actually a second grade teacher. She was, she was taught, she was uh, qualified to be a second grade teacher. So she was doing teaching for a while here and locally. And then um, eventually she went on to teach at, let me see here. She was an associate editor, editor of the school newspaper, The Index. And then she served as president of the YWCA. And then eventually she became a um, high school teacher here in Pontiac. Is that amazing? Pontiac High School. Any, any other teachers here now? Yeah, isn't that impressive? Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> I have another question. Uh, we already have determined how long did she, she live. Um, is, is there really anything else that comes to your mind about what you found in... Well, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is that this is a go-getter. She did not stop. She just kept on going. Um, she, she lived with her father and um, two sisters and a brother um, on Squirrel Road in Avon. They had a family farm. Um, her mother's name was Jane Hickmont. Her father's name was Thomas Barnett. And what else? I don't did know. she ever marry? She never got married. That okay. was the main thing I was looking for, but she never got married. Wow. So, yeah, she died at the age of 74, 75. So we're having there. All right. Thank you. Is that, is that impressive? Give her a hand. <clears throat> you know, she never got married. It was like ministry was her heart's passion. Um, at 30 years old, she birthed a church. So in a real sense, everyone who's ever been a member or part of Bethany Church, they are her children, they are her grandchildren, they are her great-grandchildren. I'm going to tell you something. Her reward will be great in heaven. Amen? Amen. This is uh, Pastor Traver. He was uh, the first pastor. He was actually the pastor of the esteemed First Baptist Church of Pontiac, where I believe that uh, Mary Barnett attended the church. <clears throat> and then she went away, you know, for college and went to the missionary training school in Chicago and, and the things that have been reported. <clears throat> and then she came back home with a passion because back in the day, there were so few cars. 1906, we're thinking, okay? that she wanted to reach the children on the west side of Pontiac, and she started a Sunday school. Pastor Traver gets all the glory because he approved it, and he helped support it, and he became the first pastor. He, he, he moved in after she did all the groundwork, the grunt work. He comes in, and he preaches, and, and he, he fills in as still First Baptist Church's pastor until they hire a pastor by the name of Tom Marsh. Now, Tom Marsh is actually a missionary from England come to America to be the pastor of the church at Bethany. At Bethany. Isn't that amazing? We're building, you see, on Jesus, on Paul, on Mary, on uh, Pastor Traver, uh, and now you got me. All right? And, and we're still building. We're building the church. Each one of these laborers, they're really overseeing Mary didn't do it all. Pastor Traver didn't do it all. I can't do it all. The passage says, tells us that it's you who do it all. We just oversee. We're just making sure the job gets done. We are a church. We're an organism and we're an organization. We're an organism in the fact that it continues to go on. It's also called a body. And like my body, the cells, it might get injured and then it scabs over, then it heals, and pretty soon it's been replaced by, by new, new parts. Same body. We're the same church. We've just been replaced by new members. As other ones have gone on and passed on or had to leave for jobs other areas, we're building on those before us. And you are the builders that are building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, if any man builds on this foundation, that's you. If any man. What are you building with? Well, the materials, the materials that the builders are using are your lives. I'm building my life on some foundation. I'm building it on the Lord Jesus Christ. This foundation, the Apostle Paul. Mary Barnett, right down the line. We're building on all those who have gone before us. Now, the next part of our passage talks about the quality of the material in which we're using. You can either have an indestructible quality of what you're using to build the church, or you can have a destructible quality of what you're using. If anyone builds, any man builds on this foundation using gold. How many here like gold? I mean, we'd like to have a lot more of it. <laughs> gold, yeah, gold. Uh, would you prefer a, a gold ring over a silver ring? Oh, yeah, every time, every time. But he says, if any man builds with gold, the second thing he says, or silver. Anybody like silver coins? Oh, yeah, I see a hand go. Only one person likes silver. Anybody else like silver coins? Oh, yeah, they're, now they're going up. You're saying, hey, he's really asking me this question. 
Hi, here we go, ladies, and costly stones. Anybody like diamonds? All right, we got some diamond lovers out there? Okay, diamonds. What's, what's he done here? He's picked the three really valuable, and, and they normally go in that order, gold, silver, diamond. Sometimes they go uh, gold, diamond, silver, but of the, uh, the, the value of what it is. He's taken very, very valuable, very uh, uh, <clears throat> dependable, and, and that they, very lasting. They're durable, very durable. And he says, you are building your life on, with stuff like gold, silver, costly stones, or you are building your life with wood. The next one is hay or straw. Now, this stuff is very destructible. It's very temporary. It, it, it's not as lasting as the other three. As the other three. He's saying, wait a second. You build in God's building, the church, your life, either with really high-quality stuff or really inferior stuff, and the question is, what are you building with? This reminds me of two other categories Apostle Paul used in uh, Galatians, which we studied last year. In the book of Galatians, he talks about the works of the flesh, which are like the wood, hay, and the straw. And he talked about the fruit of the Spirit, which is like the gold, the silver, and the special stones, the diamonds. On the one side, we have the works of the flesh. He says this. The works of the, of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. He's talking about when, when you invest your life in doing immoral things, you're missing it. You're missing it. Because those things, they're cheap. Pleasure for a moment, and then gone. The next three here are uh, idolatry and witchcraft. A spiritual person who is involved not in the Spirit of God, but they're dabbling in idolatry. They're dabbling in witchcraft. Actually, the word there is uh, pharmakai, which uh, it was uh, the drugs of the enchanters. Some would even say drug abuse. As trying to find ecstasy through a, a, a false medium rather than in a real relationship with God. The works of the flesh are emotionally, they're, they're negative. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy. Well, it's all about me, 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 and my emotions, uh, making myself feel good at the expense of others. Works of the flesh, drunkenness, orgies, where you get addicted to different vices, and then he goes on and he says, and the like. There's a whole bunch more. There are viceless other places in the Bible. Jesus lists some in the Gospels. Uh, Paul does in 1 Corinthians uh, 6. And there's this one here in Galatians. There's these viceless. He says, there's more things. You know the, the kind of things. And he says, listen, I want to warn you about this temporary stuff that you're pursuing of the world and of your flesh. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who, law, uh, who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, on the other side of that, we got the gold, the silver, the precious stones. And it's like the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit indicates first upward, but there, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, when you invest in your life in love, I love the Lord... The, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and I love my neighbor as myself. How do I do that? Well, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm living for Jesus. And that love that has been poured out in me, I'm letting it out. I'm manifesting it. The joy, I have joy. The joy of the Lord. We sing about the joy of the Lord. The world offers happiness. And the person who builds their stuff, life on happiness is building it on all the things that happen. That's where happiness comes from. Happy is unhappiness, comes on things that happen. When something happens favorably to me, I'm happy. Uh, when, when things go my way, I'm happy. But the moment they don't, I lose my happiness because they didn't go the way I want them to go. But joy is something that God gives us that doesn't matter what the circumstances are, I have the joy of the Lord. So the Apostle Paul, he's incarcerated in prison. He's singing hymns and he's praising God at the midnight hour. And uh, well, how can he do that? Or like Peter, I, I thank God that he counted me worthy to suffer shame for his name. How can they do that? 
they have the joy of the Lord. The Spirit manifests joy in the heart no matter what the circumstance. And peace. We manifest the peace of God and the peace with God. You have to have the peace with God before you can have the peace of God. You see, before I accept Christ as my Savior, I'm an enemy of God. The Bible tells me that in Romans chapter 8. I'm at enmity with God. We're enemies. Not because I, God is wanting to be my enemy, but I've made God my enemy because I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And Jesus comes along and when he saves us, he gives us peace with God. The barrier between us, our sins. It says our sins have separated us from our God. That barrier is removed, and now I have peace with God. And once I have peace with God, then he gives me the peace of God because I know I always have an open relationship with him, always, always, always. That I have a peace deep down in my heart. And so I have all these that are upward, fruit of the Spirit that directs me upward. And then I have those that are outward. Patience, kindness, goodness. I'm patient with other people. I, I don't lose my, my, my cool. We've had grandkids a lot this summer. A lot. Had two of them for a full week. Had another two of them for like four days. Had another three of them for another three or four days. And then we saw them again. And you know, after a while, when you're taking care of, I'm not used to taking care of those little kids. Like that third and fourth date, I'm a little short-fused. I'm ready to snap. My patience has worn very thin, very thin. But he says, listen, the fruit of the Spirit is <gasps> patience. Somebody said, you don't want to pray for patience. In order to get patience, you have to have troubles, trials, tribulation in your life. So you do not want to pray for patience. But once you've got the troubles, trials, and tribulation in your life, you need to pray that God will make you patient while you're in those. While you're in those. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is patience. A patient person. Kindness. A kind word turns away wrath. I put it this way when I talk to people. When you're in an argument, the person who talks the softest wins. person who talks the softest wins. Why? The person who talks the loudest is out of control because they're talking louder because they've got to get in control. And the person just responds with a kind, soft voice. The other person has to come down because they realize I'm out of control and they're in control because they're speaking soft and I've lost my cool. You see what I'm saying? The fruit of the Spirit is kindness, just being kind. Goodness, doing what is good. Our world is confused today. They don't know what the good is. They don't. Jesus said, he is goodness. He is the good. If I'm going to do the good, I'm going to have to follow in the steps of Jesus. I'm going to have to think God's thoughts after him. I'm going to have to act like Jesus acts. I'm going to have to do the good. Goodness. You see, when the Holy Spirit is in control of your life, you're walking in the Spirit, you're living in the Spirit, you have this joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And the next one we have here is inward faithfulness deep down inside you're faithful and you're true you're true a young man's going to propose to a young lady and wants to impress her about how faithful he's going to be i'm going to be a i will i will be your husband i'll be the father of your children i, I will love you every day i will provide for you i i will do everything that i can but one year day of the year i, I really want to go out with my old girlfriend how does that work that doesn't work, does it? That one, one, one day a year, that's a breach of faithfulness. Faithfulness is being loyal and true, thick or thin, for better or for worse, rich or poor, the whole thing. You're always loyal. You, you're it. God says this fruit of the Spirit makes you faithful. You're faithful. Gentleness, being a perfect gentleman. I believe the word is actually meekness. Jesus was meek, and it doesn't mean he was a sissy. He was a manly man. It's, it's the ability to know when to, be, it's, it's when to get angry and when to hold back your anger. You know, Jesus got anger, angry. There, there, there's no sin in getting angry. It's just a God-given emotion. It is how you handle your anger. Je, the Bible says the zeal of the Lord had eaten up Jesus. Man, he was really angry. Why? They'd made the temple a place of merchandise, big business, they were, they were selling offerings. And what they would do is say, oh, your offering's got a blemish. You can't use yours, so you've got to buy ours. And so they had made 
their, their worship into a big business profiteering program. And Jesus got angry. He made a, a whip and, and he drove out all the a animals. He overturned the money changer's table. Why? Because Jesus was meek. He was meek. He was the perfect gentleman. That's what the word means, to be a perfect gentleman. He got angry at the right time over the right things and he never, he didn't internalize it. He, he appropriately solved the problem. The next one is self-control. Self-control. That's having all your emotions under your control. Sometimes a person to me say to me, well, I just can't control my anger. It just rushes up within me. I say, oh, is that true? So you're in a big argument at home. You're having a, 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 a fight with your spouse or your kids, and the tempers, temp, uh, tempers are flaring, and uh, the phone, phone rings while you're venting, man. You're just venting. The phone rings, and you pick it up, and immediately when you've been screaming at this other person, you go, hello. <laughs> How do you do that? Self-control. You know what you're thinking in your head? I don't value this person I'm yelling at so much. I'm screaming at them because I don't value them as much as who might be on the other end of the phone. I value them, and so because I value who might be there, could be my boss, could be somebody really important, and I value what they might think of me, so I pull all my emotions together and get self-control. That's what this word is. The Spirit of God enables Christians to have self-control over everything. Some people say, I just can't diet. Oh, yes, you can. A diet can be a spiritual thing. You don't have to cave. The Spirit of God, when you live and you're walking the Spirit, you're relying on the Word, you're listening to the Holy Spirit, speak to your heart. Listen, you can. Look, at those are the inward things. Those are the things that are like gold, silver, precious stone. When you're living by the Spirit, and you're, you're, you're living the life that God is giving you from the Word, you are investing in your life, building in your life, you're building in your life, you're building the good stuff. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and the deeds of the flesh with all of its passions and desires because you follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. My question here today is, when we're talking about the church, which is really the people, your lives, what are you building your life with? Are you building with wood, hay, and stubble? Junk. Junk. Even the story of the three little pigs. The guy that built his house out of straw, the guy that built his house out of the, out of the, the wood, the sticks. They, it did not stand. The story would be a compliment to the Bible if the bricks had just been gold, silver, precious stones. The stuff that lasts. The stuff that lasts. Well, what are you building your life on? Is it all about you? Is it about your success? Is, is it about your pleasure, your entertainment? Are you willing to put Jesus first, even if it's going to make a little discomfort in your life, a little in your lifestyle, but you're going to do that. You're going to invest in the eternal and not in the immediate, temporary, destructible I'm going to invest in what lasts forever, forever. You see, an inspection day is coming. But his work will be shown for what it is. The building inspection day is called the day. His work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. Now, the question is, what is the day? What is the day? He's talking about what day? Is that judgment day? What day is that? I believe from my study of the Scripture, it's the day of Christ. After, when we start in, the book, uh, in October, we're going to be stu studying things to come about what's coming in the future. We've been focusing on our glorious past for almost a whole year. We're going to start looking at what's in the glorious future of the church. We're going to be looking at prophetic passages. The day of Christ is when we go to be with Christ and we are going to give an account. We're going to stand before Him and give an account of our lives. This passage tells us what it's going to be like. The day of Christ will bring it to light. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Our God is a consuming fire. He is the light. There's going to be a day when I am going to give an account for my life. And the question is going to be, what did you build your life with? 
Hmm. There's tools to test what we built our life with. And the tools, first is fire. His works, not the person, but his works. What you have done with your lives, what you've invested in, will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed by fire, and fire will test the quality of each man's work. Fire is going to be put to, whether it's gold, silver, or the precious stones, the wood, the hay, or the straw. Fire is put to all of that. It's going to test it to see what quality is. Fire, what does fire do to wood? Oh, it burns. What's it do to, to, to hay? Burns even faster. What's it do to straw? Faster yet. I get together with my brothers for uh, once a month. We get together in the summertime. We get together and we have a bonfire. We hang out. We embellish tall tales from our childhood and all those kinds of things around campfire. And we got to start the fire. Not too long ago, the wood was wet, but we met anyway. Now, we have a big, it's the propane gas tank that you put on a, a grill. And it's got a long hose on it, and we call it the flamethrower. Because <laughs> that thing puts out a flame. I mean, that flame would go from here to Lord's Supper table. Oof. We can just about start anything with that. But I'll tell you what. When we throw the kindling in there, and then we put the bigger sticks in, and then we put the logs in there, boom, that kindling is gone in a heartbeat. Whoosh, it's gone. It's like, like the straw. Then the, the kindling, you know, the, 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 after we get past the shavings, and we get the little bigger sticks. Well, they last a little bit longer. Boom, they're gone. Those logs hang around for a while. Well, we're out there for about an hour, and then, hey, is there any more logs around here? This thing's starting to die. It's getting a little chilly out here. Would you throw another log? I'm going to tell you what. It doesn't matter what those three are. They are not quality to last. They're burned. They're gone. They're consumed. That's what he's talking about here. What you're doing with your life matters. It matters. Some people often say to me, well, I just need to get saved. That's all that matters. If I get saved, I'll get to heaven by the skin of my teeth. I don't care about anything else. I'll be saved. Everything. God says, no, I want to reward you. I want to reward you. Live for me. You'll have eternal reward. But if you've invested your life in all the junk, because he's going to see what kind of quality he is. If he has built, if what he has built his life on survives, the fire's been put to it. What happens? Wood, hay, and straw, boom, they're gone. But what's it do to gold, silver, and the stones? It doesn't hurt the stones. It purifies the silver and the gold. You come out even better. So when you've lived your life for Jesus, and you're honoring him, you're glorifying him, you're living in the Spirit, you're walking in the Spirit, your life is going to... All that you've done, all that's going to last, it's going to come through even better refined. And it says, and he will receive his reward. Oh, man, he looks at it and God says, whoa, you've been faithful over this. I'm going to reward you with this. You've been faithful over this little bit. I'm going to reward you with this. You've been, reward, you've been faithful over this lot. I'm going to give you a lot of reward here. And that's kind of how it works. Some people say, well, I, I don't care if I get rewarded. Man, I'll just be in heaven. God cares that he wants to reward you. Why would you deny God the pleasure of rewarding you? We don't want to do that. We want to live for him. When we live for him, we give God the pleasure. You see, we're going to see that smile on his face, and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. He goes on and says, if it's burned up, he will suffer loss. Not loss of his life, because you're in heaven, but loss of reward. He goes on to say, he himself will be saved. You see, he doesn't lose his life, he only loses the reward. Everything he's building is like, gone. Or, if you're the other one, you've built your life on Christ, everything's there, and he says, well done. Hey, you, you, you did so well in this, I'm going to give you double, triple, I'm going to quadruple it. A hundred, hundred times reward on top of that for all eternity. 
He says he will be saved, the guy that's lost everything, but only escaping through the fire. Our expression is by the skin of his teeth. I've been looking. I don't think there's any skin on my teeth. Is there? I don't know. But that's our expression. You just barely get in. Come on, what do you want? Stand before Jesus, and he said, man, you just barely got in. What did you do with your life? Or well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in what I've given you. I am going to multiply your blessing. Which one do you want? I know which one you want. He's telling us here how to get there. Build your life on Jesus Christ. So my question is, what do we learn today? And we've been through this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first 10 and 12 verses. We are God's building. When you think of the church, don't think of this edifice. Think of people. People. We are the church. It's by grace. He saved me by grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that I'm not yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Listen. God gave me the gift of grace, of eternal life, forgiveness of sin, salvation, and the church itself. We are building our lives on those who have gone before us. We are. None of us is to be an island all to themselves. We collectively are the church of God. We must build our lives on the gold, silver, and costly stones, the things that really matter. Everything else is trivia. We will be rewarded for the quality of our living, our life now, with a well done, good and faithful servant. And finally, I didn't include this verse, but the verse before it says, we are co-laborers. I need you. You need me. Together, we build. We build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Together, we are a Jesus-built church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're very, very thankful for these instructions in this passage. We want to build our lives on the things that matter. Prompt us, O oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit to choose the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. And Lord, to forsake the, the wood, the hay, and the straw. Help us to live quality lives, Lord. And you will bless us with the quantity. Help us, Lord, to manifest the Spirit, His fruit in our lives, because you've given us the Holy Spirit. May He produce a change in our lives that we get rewarded now and for all eternity. Lord, as we come to the Lord's Supper table, we know it's a time of self-examination. You've said, let a man examine himself. Lord, uh, may we examine ourselves. What am I really building my life on? Lord, while the elements are being served, may we, may we confess those areas where we know it's just wood, hay, and straw. And put a resolve in our hearts, O oh Lord, that between now and the next Lord's Supper table, we will invest in the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. Search my heart, O oh God, see if there's any way in me that is wicked or contrary to what you would have for my life, that I might confess it. For we know that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us and purify us of all wrong. Thank you, O Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.